This looks like just another mountain north of Pemberton at the head of the Lillooet River. But it's actually the site of Canada's largest volcanic eruption in the past 10,000 years. That's like yesterday in geological terms. Mount Meager is also the site of a landslide in 2010 that is estimated to be the largest of all time in Canada. Glaciers and ice fields blanket Meager just like other volcanoes you've heard of. Mount Adams, Bachelor, Baker, Hood, Rainier, and the infamous Mount St. Helens. Those are all part of the Cascade Volcanic Arc, which the Garibaldi Volcanic Belt in BC is the northernmost part of. There are six major summits of Meager Massif. Meager with Plinth behind, Capricorn, Job, Pylon, and the Devastator. Plinth is the highest at 2,680 meters. The cause of these volcanoes is subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate under the North American plate. Volcanic activity is evident by the hot springs around Meager, of which there are at least two. The water is heated by magmatic heat and it rises through faults to the surface, which also hint that the shallow magma chamber is near. Meager has high geothermal energy resource potential, although none has been developed so far. We could be tapping into this renewable resource just like Iceland does. Other clues of volcanic activity are visible at Keyhole Falls. A lava flow came down into the valley creating a dam blocking the Lillooet River. Here you can see columnar basalt vertical walls forming a gorge, with the obvious shape of Keyhole Falls upstream. A lake was created behind the dam and when water weakened the lava formed rock, it released in an outburst flood transporting large boulders downstream for more than two kilometers. Water has continued wearing down through the rock, giving Keyhole Falls its name. This eruption originated from the Bridge River Vent, a volcanic crater that formed merely 2,400 years ago on the northeast side of Plinth. This eruption likely reached 5 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI, similar in scale to Mount St. Helens. A column of ash reached 20 kilometers high into the atmosphere, with winds carrying it as far as Alberta. It is possible that human knowledge of the eruptions at Meager in the past 10,000 years is insufficient, as it hasn't been monitored closely enough, which is still important today. Future eruption or landslide events pose a risk to people living and working in Pemberton Valley. See the 2010 slide of Capricorn Creek. Parts of the landscape there still look like the surface of the moon, 11 years later. Amazingly, no people were killed by the 2010 slide. Flooding could be caused by rapid melting of glacial ice, or outburst flood if a river is dammed and then suddenly releases. Pemberton is 50 kilometers downstream of Meager, but still first in line in terms of hazard. Scientists call Meager the most unstable mountain in Canada. Behind me is the bridge which used to span across Lillooet River, connecting to Meager Creek FSR. All that slide debris washed away the bridge, as you can see, and lifted it and carried it all the way here. So that landslide had huge power. And this is uh, just a small, small picture of that. I wanted to learn more and still had questions about volcanoes. So who better to ask than a geologist? My name is Conor Alzinga and I'm currently getting my master's degree in geology. And I would say I'm a geologist. So how the Coast Mountains have formed is there's the North American plate. Then there's the Juan de Fuca plate, which is an oceanic plate. Yeah. And that forms our mid-ocean ridge, gets deposited basalt, it's basically new crust, new land that's being formed. Of course, it's kilometers underwater, so no one ever sees it. But as the North American plate and Juan de Fuca plate move, the Juan de Fuca plate subducts underneath the North American plate because it's more dense. And as it subducts, it will cause slight uplift, which that's what we see now as the coast mountains. Then as it, also as it subducts, magma will start forming from hydrous minerals within the Juan de Fuca plate releasing the water and causing melting to occur because water causes the melting point to lower right. of minerals or rocks, either, either or, because minerals make rocks. Yeah. And then that mega will slowly rise to the surface and if it reaches to the surface, it will form a volcano. So that's happening kilometers down? 
Yeah. Kilometers? Yeah. Okay, really. Like most magma chambers are usually kilometers down, but then like this will occur down in the mantle, which is even farther. Okay. Yeah. Because that's what's directly leading to uh, the reason that Mount Meager's there. Yeah. So this lava is... Yeah, it's slowly working its way up from the mantle into the crust, and eventually it's popping out where Mount Meager is. Do hot springs exist elsewhere, not around volcanoes? Oh yes. A good example would be the Canadian Rockies. There aren't any volcanoes there, but there's these really deep faults. So basically surface water will travel down these faults, get heated up really deep underground, then travel back up another fault and come up to the surface and will be a hot spring. A lot of people don't know about the volcanoes that exist in Canada. Yeah. What can you say to that? Yeah, they're definitely not well known. And I think that's because they're not as active as say Mount St. Helens, which is really active. Or one time as a little kid, fl I flew over it and there was steam coming out of it. So it just really? clearly showed it was active. Yeah, but most Canadian volcanoes haven't erupted any time recently in history. Like yeah. human history, I should say. Like, right, yeah. yeah, yeah, where there'd be cameras pointing at it or helicopters flying over. Yeah. These are geological. So like recently, like say an eruption could have happened 10,000 years ago. That is super recent geological. And that basically still means it's active, but yeah. humans might have not been around to see that at that point. Uh, how accurate are eruptions to predict? Basically, how they're predicted is earthquake swarms, because as the magma moves up through the crust, they'll generate a bunch of earthquakes. So when there's an earthquake swarm, that's an indication that an eruption is going to happen. Of course, you get earthquake swarms like months before to hours before. <laughs> it, it ranges in a huge time scale, so it's sort of it's just a waiting game. Once earthquake swarms start happening, you just have to wait for it to erupt. Living next to a volcano is probably a risky place to choose to live. What are the, some of the biggest risks? Risks would probably, biggest risk, ash is a huge one, especially if it gets in your lungs, it can cause a bunch of issues. Lahars, which is just mud flows that can happen, especially if they're glaciated, because the glaciers can melt, release a huge amount of water, cause really mud flow. Yeah. yeah. Landslides, that's another one. Then of course the lava, <laughs> you gotta worry about that. Or if it explodes, such as Mount St. Helens, causing a huge explosion to go out, yeah. then that can be a risk too. Generally, the closer you are, the more dangerous it is but the most widespread damage that can happen from volcano is definitely the ash because it can cover such a large area right and you have lots of people lung issues thanks for your time connor appreciate you talking to me yeah, it's, glad to talk to talk with you yeah sharing your knowledge <laughs> cheers <laughs> cheers Jack Souther was a geologist and leading figure in volcanology in Western Canada. He said, quote, The flare-up of Meager Mountain 2,500 years ago raises the question, could it happen again? Was the explosive eruption of Meager Mountain the last gasp of the Garibaldi volcanic belt, or only the most recent event in its ongoing life? The short answer is, nobody really knows for sure. Oh.